do our study and we get back into Luke's Gospel, chapter 14, let's go to the Lord and ask Him to open our hearts to His Word. Heavenly Father, God, we come before You. And Lord, we do so knowing that Your Word is life. Knowing that what we see here, the spoken words of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ, are just that. They are words of life. So, Lord, we thank you that we can come together with hope, with knowledge, with encouragement, in knowing that you are in control and that you see all. Lord, there's none of us that are in your presence right now that you don't love, that you don't care for. Your word tells us you know every hair on our head. Oh, Lord, we're so thankful. It's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. As we continue in this study in Luke's Gospel, in chapter 14, we're going to see tensions between Jesus and the Jewish leaders increase. Now we know that the time is growing closer for Jesus' appointment with the cross, and so things are going to heat up as that time draws close. In this chapter, we're going to see the Lord take us through many, many great lessons concerning our priorities, our behaviors, Those who would follow him, how it is that we are to respond. And some of these lessons today, well, they're going to come to application by way of conviction of the Holy Spirit. Look at what it says in verse 1 of chapter 14. Now it happened as he went into a house of one of the rulers of the Pharisees to eat bread on the Sabbath, that they watched him closely. One of the high-ranking Pharisees invites Jesus to dinner. And this is the third time that Luke records this type of activity, Jesus being invited to a Pharisee's home. And we know that these occasions weren't friendly. We know that they weren't meant for fellowship. They were meant for ridicule, for scrutiny, for them to look and try to catch Jesus doing something wrong. But what's amazing is how Jesus didn't hesitate to accept the invitation, even though he knew what was coming. Well, we go back to chapter 7, and we know that he was invited to Simon's house, a a Pharisee, a ruler. And it was there that a woman came and broke an alabaster vase and, and anointed his feet and dried his feet with her hair. Oh, Simon was livid, proclaiming that if Jesus would have known what kind of woman this was, that he would have never let her touch him. In chapter 11, we were just there a few weeks ago, There was nothing just shy of a brawl that broke out between the Pharisees and the lawyers as Jesus took them to task about the hardness of their hearts. And now a third time, Jesus is invited to dinner and he allows himself to be put in a place, in a position of scrutiny. You know, one of the things that I love about Jesus and one of the things that I love about God's Word is that it stands man's scrutiny. You know, sometimes we get worried because we think somehow or another that we might have to defend Jesus or we might have to defend the Word of God. Guys, you don't have to. God's Word, His Son, will stand up in any circumstance that man would bring against them. What we need to do (laughs) is just acknowledge that, oh, nor does Jesus fail, nor does His Word. Look at what it says in verse 2, though. It says, And behold, there was a certain man before him who had dropsy. You have to get the picture here. Jesus comes into the house. There would have been a matter of him being ushered in in honor and, and some, sort of <coughs> some sort of place of honor in the room. And it was customary to have a visiting rabbi come and to deliver some sort of speech or make a speech at the dinner in these social events. Obviously, they had arranged to have this man with this disease, this dropsy, standing right in front of Jesus. And, well... They knew what was going to happen. Dropsy is a terrible disease. I don't know that we have something today that's similar to it, but it's where the blood capillaries burst under the skin, causing sagging and disfigurement, but also certainly and certain death. So the rabbis come to this place of bringing Jesus in, and in so doing, they want to see if he's going to break the law. They want to see if he's going to to take and and heal this man on the Sabbath. And so Jesus answers them and spoke to the lawyers and the Pharisees saying, is it lawful to heal on the Sabbath? Now, when it says Jesus answered, it doesn't mean necessarily that they ask the question out loud. Jesus just knew what was going on. He knew what was happening. And so what it says is that basically he answered them before they asked. 
And I love what it says here. He knew their hearts in the sense of knowing their whole point was rather or not it was legal, it was lawful to heal on the Sabbath. Now, according to their interpretation of the law, according to, to how they read the law, it was an easy answer. The Pharisees had determined that healing was work. Anything that was work was therefore illegal on the Sabbath, and so therefore it was, in their minds and hearts, illegal to heal on the Sabbath. Oh, it was acceptable, if necessary, to stop bleeding. If someone was bleeding to death, you could put a tourniquet on her. If somebody was under a rock and it was crushing to death, you could lift up the rock enough to, to allow them to be relieved from that imminent aspect of death. But as far as promoting anything that was healing, as far as bandaging or, or, or putting any salve on or doing anything that would cause the healing process to start, completely forbidden upon the Sabbath. But it says in verse 4 that they kept silent, and he took him, and he healed him, and let him go. And then he answered them, saying, Which of you, having a donkey or an ox that has fallen into a pit, will not immediately pull him out on the Sabbath day? And they could not answer him regarding these things. I find it so interesting. At first, they would not answer him. Do you see how that is? When Jesus posed the question, they first would not answer him, and then afterwards it says that they could not answer him. You see, Jesus was exposing what was hidden in their hearts, and he's telling them that the application that they've made of this law that prohibits the doing of good is not a proper interpretation. They want to accuse him of doing wrong, and yet, do so by the very law that was implemented by God for their good. He says, you guys show more compassion to a donkey or to an ox that would fall in a hole than you would to this man who is in desperate need of the healing from God. You know, we talk about how the law was this enormous burden for the Jews. And, and, and even though it was mostly through their own interpretations that they brought all of these constraints and all of this regulation and all of this hardship upon the people. But guys, we see a lot of the same thing happening today in our modern culture, in many organized religions. There's many religions that will place rules and regulations on the behaviors of people in order to try to control them, in order to try to have them control their behavior and somehow please God. It leads to a work-driven relationship, one of trying and failing, only to try and fail again. But yet, just as dangerous as too many regulations may be in the life of a believer, a total abandonment of any restraint is also not good. A lot of Christians have the mindset that because Christ is always faithful to forgive, that they can do whatever they want. Nothing's off limits. Nothing's illegal. Oh, the Apostle Paul told us that all things are lawful, but not everything's good for you. That's Gary's take on it. But the idea is, is that there's not this aspect of trying to figure out how to stay on which side of it. We're told that we're supposed to have a mindset that would allow us to do that which is good, not because of rule, not because of regulation, not because of something we practice, but because of love. The Apostle Paul in 2 Corinthians in chapter 5, verse 14, says, For the love of Christ compels us, because we judge thus, that if one died for all, then all died. Paul's saying that it's the love for Christ, it's the love we have for Christ, based on His love displayed to us first, that constrains us, that causes us to seek to do that which is good. And Scripture clearly identifies that the standard for Christian conduct behavior is not just a matter of right and wrong, especially right, as, right and wrong as we would see it. The standard for Christian conduct, conduct is what brings the glory of God based on our genuine love for Jesus Christ. If we really love Christ... If we're really grateful for salvation, we will strive to do that which brings Him glory, brings Him on honor, not just striving after the fulfillment of some sort of rule or regulation or legal requirement. Jesus, once again, as He does consistently throughout His entire ministry, He brings down and boils the law 
into the heart rather than into the letter and into the mind. He wants a heart behind what we do, not just trying to fulfill some letter or some obligation or regulation. In verse 7, he continues with a parable addressing now another matter of the heart. He says, so he told a parable to those who were invited. And when he noted how they chose the best places, saying to them, when you're invited by anyone to a wedding feast, do not sit down at the best place, lest one more honorable than you be invited by him. And he who invited you and him come and say to you, give place to this man, then you will begin with shame to take the lowest place. Again, I get the picture of Jesus being in this house and, and, and there would have been a courtyard and there would have been an inner area where there would have been a table. And these things are about to start taking, taking place. And He would have looked with disapproval at this time knowing what was about to come. You see, dinners at this time customarily were set up to where there would be specific places of honor at the table. Of course, at the head of the table would be the master of the house. And at, at the table area, there were normally center positions and in a position right and left, which meant that on each side of the table there were three seats or three places of reclining. And so in each center spot on each side of the table was the place of honor. And if you were sitting there, it was considered that you were literally better than the others at the table. And Jesus says, when you come into one of these places, be careful. Because culturally they wanted to be elevated. Culturally, they wanted to have some sort of, of, of recognition of how good they were and how special they were. And guys, nothing's changed today. I mean, we see it all the time in formal events and stuff where there's seating charts and there's all of this energy and effort goes into who's going to sit where. We want to make sure that we put this person next to that person and this person next to it because it shows and it demonstrates their authority or their power or their place of influence and how important they really are. This picture would have been a little comical though because what Jesus is talking about is how as they would get ready for dinner, guys would start sneaking over closer and closer to the door where the dining room was so that when they called for dinner that they could rush in and slip into that middle seat. And Jesus says, be careful. If you sit there and that's not where the master wants you to sit, he's going to say, get up. You don't belong there. Go over here in one of these other seats. He says, you need to watch. You need to be cautious. You need to be careful. But when you are invited, go and sit down in the lowest place so that when he who invited you comes, he may say to you, friend, go up higher. Then you will have glory in the presence of those who sit at the table with you. For whoever exalts himself will be humbled. And he who humbles himself will be exalted. Those who exalt themselves are going to be brought down. They're going to be humbled. Whereas God loves those who will willingly humble themselves. Before. You know, humility is a big thing for God. I mean, it really truly is. God wants to be the one to lift us up. He doesn't want us trying to lift ourselves. He knows that our efforts at best are going to fail completely. So he wants to be the one to lift us up. And he says, when it comes to your pride, you need to humble yourself in my sight, says the Lord. Then I'll lift you up. The Lord wants to give good things to the humble, but he's going to resist the proud. We understand that this is totally opposite of what the world teaches. I mean, this is completely opposite. The world says that you need to be aggressive, assertive. You need to have a huge self-esteem button that every time you need it, you just push it and you are just esteeming yourself on all sides. And the picture of yourself needs to be better than everyone else. You need to look at yourself and think you're better than all the rest. For this reason, a lot of people buy into the idea that their opinion of themselves and their esteeming of themselves is really where they want to live. They come to this idea that they, they recognize that they can genuinely serve themselves. They just can't serve anybody else. We see it in the famous elite, in business, oh, and all over the place in the political world, where folks really believe that somehow or another, they really truly believe that their contribution is better than anybody else's. It's more important. They even have a, a calling to do something that is more and higher and superior to all of those around them. So therefore, they need to be recognized. Their place needs to be one of honor and all that goes along with it. 
Jesus says, I'm not impressed. (laughs) And neither is your father. If you're seeking that for yourself, if you're seeking to be elevated, then that's not the place that is going to earn you favor with God. But you know, humility is a hard thing. For us to have a proper assessment of who we are, humility is going to play a part in that. And so is pride. There's going to be an element of this battling back and forth between each other. On the one hand, I want to do exactly what I'm supposed to do and do it to the very, very best of my ability. And I want to do it as as close to perfect as possible. And if I do that, there's almost no way that it's not going to draw attention to my efforts. There's, there's almost no way. If you do a good job and somebody sees that you did a good job, boy, it's hard not to go, okay, thanks. And to even feel a sense of pride over doing something and doing it well. Now there's a, another extreme that goes along with that, and the extreme is, is to where we would take and we would not recognize any value to who we are or what we do at all. And the problem is, is when we come to this place of self-denigration, we come to this place where we underplay everything, there's also a, a place where we cross over a line to where it becomes false humility, which is just reverse pride. And it's hard, because there's that balance between Doing something well, and somebody comes to you and they say, wow, that's really great. Man, that looks fabulous. And you go, oh, no. It wasn't me. It was all God. Praise be to God. And the whole time you're just going, oh, it feels so... So it's hard. I mean, it really truly is. It's hard. We're wired in such a way, and we're told from very, very young that we're supposed to try to achieve, that we're supposed to do our best. We're supposed to put our best foot forward. We're supposed to do our best work. There's nothing wrong with that. The question only becomes one of who gets the glory. Who gets the glory? I mean, I love the fact that God allows us to be successful. I love that. I love that God will pour into and He'll use gifts and He'll use talents and He'll, he'll use His Spirit in the sense of bringing to our hearts and to our minds this sense of accountability and responsibility in the areas in which we are to excel. And it's all because God has a plan and a usefulness for us. It's never wrong to take great pride in knowing that God is using you for the kingdom. It's not wrong for us in any way, shape, or form to ever come to the point where we would not boast in God and His power and His use. of That's exactly how we're supposed to do it. The only question is, if we ever get to the point to where we want to take that glory that belongs to Him and make application in our own lives and somehow use or borrow or use that. And God says, you don't need to do that. You can boast in me. I'll use you. I will use you for great things. I will use you in places where you could never have been used. But leave my glory to me. You be my servant. And we will be esteemed in the eyes of God. And guys, it is so important. And He so much desires. He doesn't want us walking around beating ourselves up, thinking that we're, we're of no value. He just wants us to know that He's the author of all of that which is glory and honor, and it's His. And verse 12, And He also said to him who invited Him, When you give a dinner or a supper, do not ask your friends, your brothers or relatives, nor rich neighbors, lest they also invite you back and repay you. But when you give a feast, invite the poor, the maimed, the lame, the blind, and you will be blessed because they cannot repay you. For you shall be repaid at the resurrection of the just. So now Jesus has called several motives into place here. The first was the heart of the Pharisees who would hold some sort of requirement or hold some sort of legalistic aspect over that of doing good for others. Then he calls into question the motives of the guests. And he says, hey, don't seek to elevate yourself. Make sure that you're, you're elevating others. Make sure that you take the place of the lowliest. Let me be the one that lifts you up. And now he says to the masters, he says, watch your motives as well. And we've seen this because we just talked about it here in past weeks about this aspect of laying up treasure in heaven. About how it is that that which we would take and and try to accumulate on earth is not that which has got any real internal value. 
What God, good is it is if, if we only serve those who serve us back? Now understand, again, this is, this is a hallmark of the world. That if we want to climb the social ladder, that if we want to get into the group with the shakers and the movers, if we want to be able to excel, if we want to move up in our social class or in our economic class or in our financial areas or, or in business, that we need to be positioning ourselves next to the shakers and the movers. It's the political season. And we're going to have candidates that are going to want to woo us and tell us how much they're going to do for us. And they, they would come, actually they'd already be here if the doors were open, so it's almost kind of like a blessing. Because all of a sudden they come to church. And they want to shake hands, and they want, to, they want to be seen in circles, and they want to talk about how they're going to do things the way that we would want them to do it. And all they're doing is trying to posture and position themselves in such a way that they can influence us by virtue of aligning with us. And guys, that goes with anything. It's so much within business, not a matter of what you know, but we've heard it, it's about who you know. Huh. Well, guys, think about this for a minute. We know the ultimate who. It is about who you know. And who we know, and who is also one who knows us, is Jesus Christ. It's amazing how many folks will spend just enormous amounts of money to try to throw some sort of event to where they can invite people for the sole purpose of being in the proximity of, around somebody that's famous. Do you realize that there's people that have become famous just because they hang out around people that are famous? Have you ever thought about how some of these celebrities got to be celebrities? It's like, what, what does this guy do? This guy or this person does nothing except hang out around other people that do. So they're famous, be, famous for being famous, and that's all they're good for. Remember a few years back? Oh, it was under another administration. There were some folks that crashed a party at the White House. Do you remember that? They got all dressed up, right? And they, they went walking in like they belonged there. And it's funny because they had like the, the whole reception thing and they, they had the cameras on them. And these folks, they showed them, they come cruising through and they just, they looked like they belonged there. And they got all the way in and they were able to take and socialize within the, within the I don't think they even really found out about it until after the event. And the people that put on the show were appalled. Not only had these people come to an event that they were not worthy to attend, but they had gotten past security. They just waltzed in like they belonged there. They looked like the rest of the beautiful people that were showing up at a beautiful event, but they got so bent out of shape, and it wasn't even the fact that they got in. It wasn't the fact that they got past the, the security or anything else. What really bothered them, they didn't belong there. These people dressed up and acted like people that were worthy to go to the White House, but they weren't worthy to be there. And those that were got very, very upset that these commoners, these lowly life forms, crashed their party. How sad it is when we try to impress man that God's not impressed at all. <laughs> Guys, as a matter of fact, you need to do something for those that can't do anything for you. We used to have a used to have, still have an expression that says that I love you for nothing. I love you for nothing. Well, now, it's great to love somebody because of what they do for you or for what they will give back, and it's great to love and to have somebody love you back. That's reciprocal aspect of a relationship is wonderful, but we're supposed to be able to look at somebody and say, regardless of what you can provide me, regardless of what you give me, regardless of what you take from me, and never return. I love you. I love you for nothing. That's what Jesus did. You see, we can't hold any other standard because Jesus loves us, loved us to death in order to secure us, and we still can't give anything back that's of any value. We still can't give anything back that, that, that takes and, and, and increases who He is. All we can do is demonstrate our love and faithfulness to Him. It's so important. One of the things that has become glaringly apparent. Now, I know that we're missing certain things right now culturally. 
I mean, there hasn't been any sports. So the athletes that are normally everywhere influencing and, and, and using their position and their posture in order to be able to take and, and to do a, a message, be it good or not so much, it doesn't matter. Have you noticed that they haven't been out there lately? Has anybody really missed their contribution? I haven't missed any of the movie stars or celebrity and, and their insightful commentary concerning world issues. Now, they keep trying to, by virtue of doing commercials from time to time, to stay relevant, but the, the, the reality is, is we haven't missed them much or the things that they contribute because their contribution really isn't that much, is it? But don't be afraid. As soon as things open up, especially since we're in an election year, they will be flooding the airways with their valuable commentary and insights on how it is that we should operate and how the country should be. So they'll be back. I mean, they're already starting to crawl out from under the places in which they inhabit in order to do so. So be careful. They are coming back. Now, in verse 15, when one of those that sat at the table with him heard these things, he said to him, Blessed is he who shall eat bread in the kingdom of God. This is another one of those situations where the air in the room is so thick you could cut it with a knife. Jesus is laying it out, and he's bringing some very, very hard things against these Pharisees and these lawyers, and he's not sparing anyone. And maybe just to try to break the tension, this guy wants to throw something out, and so he uses this Jewish idiom, Blessed is he who shall eat bread in the kingdom of God. He's just trying to ease the moment a little bit. Just, just get off of the topic. Let's talk about something better. And what he doesn't realize is he just gave Jesus the perfect segue. He just gave him the perfect transition into the next thing to talk about. Oh, let's talk about those that will get into the kingdom. And look at what it says. Then he said, A certain man gave a great supper and invited many. And he sent his servant at supper time to say to those who were invited, Come, for all things are now ready. But they all with one accord began to make excuses. You know, it was Ben Franklin who said that a man that is good at making excuses is seldom good at anything else. Jesus is now talking about the marriage supper of the Lamb, to which all are invited. Every single person is invited to receive salvation. The call goes out to everyone, but not everyone will respond. As a matter of fact, there's many that will make excuse. The first said to him, I've just bought a piece of ground, and I must go see it. I ask you to have me excused. So this first man says, I've got to go check out a piece of property. Now, the excuse is not concerning the need to go see a plot of land. That's really not what this individual is saying. What the individual is saying is, is that I have a focus on my possessions. I want to go see something that I possess. I want to go see the thing that, that is more important to me than an invitation to, to, to receive the Lord. It's more important for me right now to find myself in a place of looking at that which I already possess. And another said, I've bought five yoke of oxen and I'm going to test them. I ask you to have me excused. The second says, hey, I just bought a new work truck. I just bought a new tractor. I just bought something really, really important to me that's going to gain me in the place of my business. And what I have to do is I have to, have to go shore up my business venture. I have to go see what it is that, 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 that I can do in order to be able to shore up these things. So I can't be bothered with an invitation right now. I'm too busy. i got too much business happening. The third says, I have married a wife. And therefore, I cannot come. This is a real winner. My wife won't let me. I mean, that's really what he's saying. I, I, I've, got, I've got all of these worries. I've got all of this natural affection for the things of the world. And they're taking priority over the invitation that Jesus has given and extended to me for salvation. 
And oh, it's not just about wives. It's about this natural affection. I've heard tons of excuses as to why people don't answer the invitation of Christ. Of course, the greatest and the most dawning aspect of this is the rejection of salvation. And that's really what is happening as Jesus is establishing to, to the Jews that were there, to the leaders, to the Pharisees, to the, to the lawyers, that, that you've been extended an invitation and you're too busy with your own stuff. You're going to miss salvation because you're not going to come to this, to this dinner, to this feast that is being provided. Because I see another application to this. I see a connection to our lives as Christians because I think that there's times when we too allow our, our priorities to fall to our possessions or our business or our natural affection. Now, this is going to cause a few of you to get ruffled. But I've heard people say, well, you know, ever since we bought the, and you get to fill it in, could be the boat, the motorhome, the quads, the toys, the whatever. But ever since we bought those, you know, the only time that we have to use those is on the weekends. And so I have to go out and i got to make sure that those things are working right. And besides that, it's the only time that I'm not working. And during the week, I don't really have any time for things of the Lord. So I've got I've to make sure that I work all week and then the weekends, the time. that's my family time. And isn't that important to the Lord? Of course it is. Or the job is just so overwhelming. I can't, I can't see my way clear. There's so many things that are happening right now. Maybe, maybe it's a matter of just trying to excel from one point to another. I'm trying to elevate this. And the Lord understands because He's providing me this path. And the whole time I believe that what the Lord would say is, no, 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 I've invited you to come spend time with me. I am so thrilled with the prospect of us being able to come back together. I miss you guys. I miss having you here every Sunday. I miss the opportunity to be able to, to, to see you and to hug you and to, and to encourage you and to be encouraged by you. And it's something that is just a part of us. And that's part of that invitation of the Lord is for us to come together. And it's one of the reasons why it's so important that we, that we don't, don't fall away from fellowship. And it'll be okay. We're getting back. But the reality is, we need to never allow our priorities to fall into our possessions or on a business or even on natural affections above and beyond the things of the Lord. In verse 21 it says, And so that servant came and reported these things to his master. Then the master of the house, being angry, said to his servant, Go out quickly into the streets and the lanes of the city and bring in here the poor and the maimed and the lame and the blind. And the servant said, Master, it is done as you commanded, and we still have room. Then the master said to his servant, Go out into the highways and the hedges and compel them to come in that my house may be filled. For I say to you that none of these men who were invited shall taste my supper. Do you know who he's talking about when he says the poor, the maimed, the lame, and the blind? That's me. That's you. That's the ones that, that, because of the rejection of the Jews, the Lord spread salvation to those of us that are outside. The Apostle Paul tells us that, that, that in Romans that we were grafted into this olive, the olive tree, that we're the wild branch that has been grafted into the olive tree while some of the branches of the olive tree have been cut off. Now a great multitude went with him. And he turned and said to them, If anyone has come to me and does not hate his father and mother, wife and children, brothers and sisters, yes, and his own life also, he cannot be my disciple. All right, let's jump down to verse 27. Well, maybe not. At first read, this looks really bad. I mean, at first read, it's like, wait, this is so out of character. I mean, how can Jesus say that, that, that we're supposed to hate our families? We're supposed to hate people. We're supposed to love even our enemies. But in order to understand this, we have to factor in the cultural understanding and the, and, and the language and where our language falls short, short in relationship to what this is really truly saying. See, Jesus is using a comparative, and he's comparing comparing what our love for Him should look like in relationship to our love for our families. And he's saying that his, his place and the way that we should love Him should make what we do with our families and those that we care for look like hate. 
It should be so strong. And guys, we normally frame things in like one of three ways. You know, we either hate something, we love something, or we can be neutral. And now there's a lot of room for variables within that, but that's normally where we're at. I either, I either love broccoli or I hate it. I'll let you figure out which one is which. Or I can be neutral. What Jesus is saying so clearly is not that we're supposed to despise, not that we're supposed to hate, not that we're supposed to, to not care for and love our families, but he's, he's saying in comparison to how much you love them, it should look like hate in comparison to how much you love me. And in that context, it makes perfect sense. But yet we also know that the love that we have for the Lord will from times put us at odds with our family. And there will be that hardship and there will be that disconnect. And, and Jesus never said that following Him was going to be easy. As a matter of fact, He's given us just the opposite as, as how it's going to go. But it's going to cause pain. It's going to cause separation between those that would have us put them first before Jesus. And some of you have come from families like that. Some of you have experienced relationships with friends and family that have ended because of your relationship with Jesus Christ. Some of you have lost unbelieving spouses because you are walking with the Lord and they've walked away because you won't side with them. Christ says, if you're going to follow me, then you have to count the cost. And it will cost you everything. And it's one of the reasons, again, why it's so important, why it's so vital that we stay connected to a body, that we stay connected with brothers and sisters, that this becomes our family, not that we would reject our family, but continue to love and try to reach them. But this guy, guys, this is the family. This is the body of Christ. This is our family. And whoever does not bear his cross and come after me cannot be my disciple. Now again, we've talked about this aspect of bearing one's cross. It's not some burden or hardship that God puts upon us. Living with difficulty, regardless of what it is, doesn't represent our cross to bear. The cross that Jesus calls us to carry is the same cross that He carried. It was a cross of total submission to the will of the Father. I mean, that's really what, what this cross represents. The cross of Jesus is the perfect picture of complete submission as it represents the will of the Father being manifest in His Son. And in order to be a disciple of Jesus Christ, we have to be willing to surrender everything that we are to the Lord. The amazing thing about this whole surrendered life is that we get back so much more than we could ever provide. If I was to tell you whatever, if you had a prized possession that you'd work very, very hard for, and you had one of something that you greatly prized, and I said, all right, here's the thing. If you will give that to me, I'll give you three or four of those in better shape than the one that you've got. How many of you would sign up for that? Oh, what if I said every single need that you could ever have without having to ever worry about it again? You don't, you don't ever have to be concerned. How, how about I bring you one of those publishers' clearinghouse checks and hand it to you in your driveway and take pictures of it? How many of you would say, if you'll give me everything you've got, I'll bring you one of those checks? How many of you would sign up? Of course we would. I mean, you've you got to be kidding. You mean I can take and I can have an expectation of receiving more than I could ever provide for myself if I take you up on your offer? Yes. That's exactly what Jesus Christ says. It's exactly what Jesus is saying. He says there's nothing that you're going to ever achieve, there's nothing that you're ever going to come by on your own that is going to be better than what I'm going to provide you. And what it requires is you have to be willing to surrender your life. And in the exchange you'll receive everything that I am rather than just everything that you want to be. And then he goes on and he says that we need to do the math. Look at what it says in verse 28. For which of you intending to build a tower does not sit down first and count the cost? Rather, he has enough to finish it. At least after he has laid the foundation and is not able to finish, all who see it begin to mock him, saying, This man began to build and was not able to finish. Christ used another parable in describing this building of a tower. And these towers were, were very common in the vineyards. And what they would do is they would build this elevated on, on the side of a hill or something tower in which the owner 
or the, 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 the manager could live in during the time of harvest and he could observe and he could watch everything that was happening in the vineyard. And it was an important aspect. But what he's talking about here is he says, how is it, how is it that, that, that you would go into a building without counting the cost? Jesus says, follow me and count the cost. Now the problem is, is that we often look at this as some sort of deficit spending kind of thing. Okay, if I'm going to follow Jesus, I've got to give up everything and then I've got to settle for less. Okay, so what's the downside? I've got to see what the downside is. What am I really going to give up here in order for me to follow Jesus and see if I'm willing to do that? I want to count the cost. And guys, that's not what Jesus is saying at all. That's not what Jesus is saying. A better understanding of this would be that we would look at the difference to what we bring to the table and what He brings to the table. To count the cost means that we look up and we look to what He offers and compare to what we have. I says, you would be crazy to try to build something that you are building on your own without having the means. How do we receive the means? How are we going to finish the building that's going to go up in the back of this place? You know what? This whole aspect of counting the cost really gets to me sometimes when we're in this thing because you know what? Stuff like this costs a lot of money. And boy, we're just about ready to, to do some things and we've already scratched some really big checks and I mean, there's this pot of money over here and there's the, 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 the flow at the, at the pot where you just take the pot and okay, there's the money and you go, and you go, wow, there's not much left in the pot. But you see, we're not trying to build this in our strength. We're depending on God. We're depending on Him and we're depending on the mission and the vision that He's given us in order to be able to continue through with this. So we've counted the cost. We've got it to call us and say, we ain't got it. We've got to depend on Him. And He says, I want you to do that in your own life. I want you to count the cost and recognize that if you depend on yourself, that if you don't depend on me, that you are always going to come up short. You're going to be called foolish because you couldn't finish. And oh, how I want us to finish well because of our recognizing of who it is that we serve. Or what king going to make war against another king, doesn't sit down first and consider whether he's able with 10,000 to meet him who comes against him with 20,000. Or else while on the, the other is still a great way off, he sends a delegation and asks conditions of peace. So likewise, whoever of you does not forsake all that he has cannot be my disciple. Again, what are we going to bring against God? What are we going to amount? What are we going to have in, in, in some way or another that is going to be able to stand up against what He is bringing? Isn't it better to make peace with the Lord God of the universe? The requirement for discipleship, first, to love the Lord above all else. The second, to surrender by submitting everything to the Lord. And the third is to forsake all that we have in order to follow Him. Jesus doesn't want anything to be between us and Him, that we would hold nothing higher than Him. Salt is good. But if the salt has lost its flavor, how shall it be seasoned? It is neither fit for the land nor for the dunghill. But men throw it out. He who has ears to hear, let him hear. This is actually pretty funny because salt is salty. Salt cannot be not salty. If it's salt, it has to be salty. I mean, I mean you've you got to see, we've stumbled onto a, to a truth here. If it's salt, it has to be what? Salty. Hmm. So, if we truly believe, if we are truly a disciple of Jesus Christ, if we have surrendered all to Him, we are going to be those who salt the earth. We don't have a choice if we're salt. But if salt, or that which was intended to be salt, is not operating through submission to the will of the Lord, then we're not salty. Then what good are we? I mean, what, what good are those that call themselves Christians but don't have any manifestation of the fruit of the Spirit in their life. What good is it when, when we, we call ourselves a Christian or have a desire for the Lord, but yet that desire doesn't translate into us wanting to do that which serves Him based on the love that we have for Him? It's kind of like, babe, if you ain't salt, you ain't salt. But if you are, 
there's not going to be any hiding it. And often when we're faced with these truths, it causes us in our, in our hearts to, to kind of recoil a little bit. It causes us to, uh, is he talking about doing things? Is he talking about, you know, giving, giving time and talent and treasure to the church? Is he talking about, what, 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 uh, I mean, should I have actually got up and got dressed this morning instead of sitting here in my PJs? Yes. But see, that's called conviction. And I would be more worried if it didn't bother you than if the Holy Spirit would take it, he'd knock on your heart and he'd say, hey, how salty are you today? <laughs> how salty are you right now? Are you really being salt? Because see, salt has this incredible property. Salt not only adds flavor to things, it preserves. It, it's a preservative. You can salt meat, and you guys know this. You can salt a piece of meat, and it can sit and hang in some of the most unusual places, and you can go back to it later on and cut that part off that you wouldn't eat, and underneath it, hey, it's still edible. See, it's preservation. It preserves. And that's exactly the role that Jesus wants us to have in this, in this world. He wants us to be that which adds flavor and leads people to preservation in Him, who is Jesus Christ. So what do we learn today? Well, first, Jesus wants us to be careful. He wants us not to let our rules and our regulations overrule our hearts for others. So be careful that you don't make some sort of application that excludes the doing of good for others. He wants us to be humble, seeking to serve rather than to be served. And then He wants to be the one who raises us up he wants to be the one, based on us coming to Him in submission, that allows then Him to be the lifter of everything that we are. He wants us to surrender everything, just as He did, in seeking the will of the Father. And then He wants us to be salty. <laughs> I mean, He wants us to add that flavor to the lives of the people of the world and to be that which would be preserving them by virtue of leading them to the only one in which salvation can be found. Guys, as we get ready to close today, I want to just share a few thoughts with you concerning where we are in this whole process. It's been a long time since we've been together. It's, it, it's, it's two months, and it looks like it could be still weeks down the road in relationship to any process of coming back in and, and coming together. And so I want to give you a few thoughts that I've had. First off, I've got to tell you, there's been times during this whole process when I've kind of got down when I've kind of got beat up, when I've even got mad and angry at what I see going on in the world. And, and, and what happens is, is that I wind up being frustrated, even to the point of anger. And what I find is it's the difference between where it is that I'm getting my information and where I'm listening to. Hmm. It's really easy to just listen to all what's happening in the world and all that's coming through the news channel, regardless of what news channel you listen to. And find yourself just coming to this place of total frustration and anger. And, and, and what I would challenge you with is I would listen for the voice of the Holy Spirit and, and, and let Him speak to you and ask you about if you're being salty or not. Is that salt or is that something else <laughs> that you're exhibiting that's coming out of you? I want to encourage you that if you start feeling that way, that you would move back into a place of closer relationship with Jesus Christ, that you would move back into His Word, that you would move back into worship, that you would move back into a place of prayer. Now, with that in mind, we're going to start doing some things around here that we're allowed to do based on what the latest recommendations and orders that are coming out of the the government, Monday through Thursday of this week, from 10 in the morning until 2, the doors of the church are going to be open. And they're going to be open for anyone that wants to come here for prayer. And we're going to maintain social distancing, and we're going to maintain proper sanitation levels and those type of things. But if you want to come, and it's not a set time for worship, it doesn't mean it starts at 10 or 9 and, or 10 o'clock and goes to 2. It means that between the hours, Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, of 10 o'clock to 2 o'clock, that there'll be someone here 
one of the elders or one of the pastors to pray with you. If you want to just come and you want to just sit in the sanctuary and you just want to pray, there'll be a place for you to do that. Now, it isn't about the place that makes the prayer right, but there is something about coming to the house of the Lord and, and being able to, to be here again in your presence. And so I want to encourage you that if that's, you, if that's something that you, that you would like to do, then I want to encourage you to do that. And it will be safe. It will be okay for you to be able to come in. We're going to have a, a communion table that's set here. If you want to come and you want to take communion, you can do so. If you meet up with one of the pastors or one of the elders and you want them to, they will lead you in communion and pray with you. They just won't get real close to you because we're going to maintain doing that which we've been told we're supposed to do. But we're going to start seeing the opportunity to come back into God's house, as we will this afternoon here in just a few moments. The other thing that I want to share with you is I want to talk to you about next week's service. Next week's service, we are doing drive-in church. Now, i got to tell you what, I kind of avoided doing this to begin with because I thought, man, we're, just, we're going to open up and it's going to be good. But you know what? We need to come together. We need to raise, raise our voices from this place, from God's house and from, from this location. So here's how it's going to work. Next week at the 9 o'clock service, we're going to open the gate at about 8.30. And at 8.30, anybody that's lined up, anybody that wants to is going to be able to come in and we're going to do a live drive-in service in the back parking lot. And we'll have it all set up, and you don't have to worry about how it's going to work. We'll direct you when you come in. You'll know how it works, and there'll be a set of guidelines on how it is that we're supposed to do this. But we'll be able to see each other. You may have to stay in your car, but you'll be able to wave at your neighbor. Right? Now, what I can't guarantee is that we can arrange the cars in the same place you set in the sanctuary. <laughs> if you drive a big truck, you'll probably have to go towards the back so that the people in the front can see. So if you're going to be in a, in a sedan, we may choose you first to come in through the gate and organize it a little bit better. But we're going to open up, and we're going to be able to roll down the windows, and we're going to be able to play worship off of the, 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 the back of the, the, the stage out there, and we're going to be able to do so in such a way that God's people can raise their voices collectively in worship to Him. So we're going to do that next week. There'll be a lot more information. I'll be talking about it all week on Facebook, and we'll be giving you direction and stuff, so you don't need to call. You don't need to worry about, well, what do I do? What do I do? All you got to do is get in your car and show up here next week around 8.30, and you'll get in for the service because we'll put in as many folks as show up. So if that's you, be praying about that. Be praying about the preparation for that because we are so thrilled to start looking forward to a time when we can come back together and worship and fellowship. The deployment is about over. <laughs> the time of which we would have been called away from this house and being able to come back, well, is slowly but continually advancing. So let's pray. Heavenly Father.